Welcome to the latest episode of the Informing Choices Minipod. The need to produce food for increasingly urbanized populations in ways that pays attention to the requirements for minimizing carbon emissions and therefore help to minimize climate change is clear. In farming, carbon emissions come from crop fertilization using chemical fertilizers, materials used to build and maintain farms, energy use of the farm buildings and vehicles, transport and distribution during and after growing, soil-based emissions from disturbing soils and waste produced as a result of the farming process. So in that context, what is the future of agricultural efficiency? To consider this question, I'm delighted to welcome Adam Greenberg, CEO of UNU, an industrial computer vision company based in the US. Adam, welcome to the podcast. First thing you'd better do is explain what an industrial computer vision company is. Uh, thanks, Steve, for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, excited to be here. The, the idea of an industrial computer vision company just comes from the manu- started off in the manufacturing industry. And that is the concept that when you're putting together industrial processes and industrial process optimization, uh, we no longer have the ability to be as precise as we need to be for the latest technologies and to have the ideal outcomes. And you can't have a person every six inches to look at the next part of the process. And so it turns out you can augment a process and a flow by incorporating, if you will, expanding the eyes of, of, of a few operators by having the cameras that can do that every six inches or in our case, cover every single plant in the entire farm. And so when it comes down to it as an industrial computer vision company, we use the latest in machine vision, AI, and bring, that, bring those technologies along with uh, image collection devices, also known as cameras, yeah. And you combine those things together and you get yourself a way to optimize processes throughout your entire farm, allowing you to do more and be more precise and more granular with less. Well, that takes us really nicely into, into the first question and, you, and you've started to answer it really. So, so, you know, how do the range of technologies you work with increase productivity and efficiency because those things are different and vitally important if we want to get more from less aren't they yeah and, and there's the whole spectrum of technologies that, that today something so simple to people who aren't in farming as oh if you don't do flood irrigation and you do drip irrigation you can save more water right that that was a giant game changer for the industry over the last 20 to 30 years and today there's still drip irrigation getting put out in a way that uh, saves a tremendous amount of water and allows us to increase yield. And then there's the and then there are the technologies on the other side of the spectrum, which are working on the granularity of optimizing for every single fruit or for every single flower or for every single leaf and everything in between. So the the technologies there are the spectrum of technologies, depending on how much you want to invest. The more you invest up front today, generally the more granular of control you have in your recipes or your growing protocols that allow you to drive optimized yield outcomes. And, and do these technologies allow the growing of, of food close to environments where we might not have been able to do that before? Yeah, I, I think there's... Growing food where it's needed most is the decentralization of farming that Mm -hmm. is bringing us back to our roots. So if you look at, uh, and no pun intended, I care, uh, (laughs) but the the idea that 200 years ago, before the Industrial Revolution, we were completely decentralized. We were just learning how to bring and, and bring dried fish around, right? So the idea was all about how do we get enough calories locally for 365 days a year for, for just staying alive, right? It was not, we were not, and then we hit the age of the industrial revolution. And then we hit the age of really calorie abundance because we learned about preservatives. And so we centralized it all because we had preservatives and, and calorie abundance. And then, then we did a bunch of analysis on that. It turns out it wasn't as healthy as the local stuff. And so now we're seeing us going back to the 
decentralized production, more local, more healthy. And in the driver of that momentum is the driver of that momentum is coming from consumers, right? So consumer demand is driving fresh local produce. And so production of all of the fresh fruits and vegetables that you want to buy at the, at the grocery store happening down the street or really in the suburbs because it's a lot cheaper and still local, uh, that has become a, a massively not only profitable and successful trend, but it's exactly what consumers are demanding. And so that's why we're seeing to not only technologies and consumers, but also the whole food supply chain become compressed because before when you had centralized farming and that allowed you to have two or three distributors in between. Today, if they're only 20 minutes away from the city center, it makes a lot of sense to have maximum one distributor. Does that shift start to create some kind of capacity issues? I mean, certainly from a, from a US perspective, I'm thinking here where you've got such vast areas of land that you can grow food in to be able to concentrate that into an urban setting are there additional challenges that come to bear or do the systems and the technologies that you're talking about kind of offset the capacity things by creating more production capacity in a smaller area the word that comes to mind is leverage right so by taking a vast amount of land and, and concentrating it so it's 10 to 30 times more productive mm -hmm. per square foot you're increasing the leverage of your farm. So when you invest in that one square foot or that one square meter, and then you invest in the systems and the tools to control the granularity of that, you're leveraging yourself up. So if you make a mistake or something goes wrong, there's a lot more to lose. Yeah. But in doing so, you also have much more to gain. And so it is a higher leveraged form of food production in that we have now brought enough reliable technologies to bear, and Europe is a great, great example of this, more so than almost anywhere else in the world, where they've been, Europe has been leveraged and producing the greenhouses for decades. And so if you look at greenhouses or vertical farms in the US, there are massive ones expanding, you know, it's growing at 20%. North American greenhouse square footage is growing on average about 20% per year, which is massive, right? Millions of square feet just popping up of glass. But a lot of that technique and technology was learned in Europe. And so now we're, 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 we've learned and, and humanity has spent the last 40 years learning how to increase the production of a single tomato plant or a single lettuce plant. And so that's led to the concept of, well, yes, we're moving to local production, and yes, where it allows us to produce more and we're increasing our leverage. But at the same time, when you talk about the fields and what happens at the vast amount of space in at the US, they're lower, there's a lot lower leverage in that, right? You have a lot more margin for error. And so we don't see, I, I don't see corn production going away anytime soon from the plains, right? Because you, you're not making enough revenue per square foot for that vast amount of acreage yep. that it, that makes sense. It's not even economically viable to grow in a greenhouse. And so where we're, we're, I see the shift is, is there's going to be a delineation. You can almost think of it like a crop circle target, right? right. In the very center of a city, you're going to have microgreens. You're going to have things that you can get $200 a pound for. And then in the suburbs and the outskirts, you're going to have greenhouse production of all of your fresh local fruits and vegetables, right? Because that's what people are willing to pay for. But if it's not fresh local produce, they're not willing to pay a lot more for it. So thus you're still going to need the rural areas for all the commodities. And that's where you get corn, soy, wheat, sorghum, et cetera. That's, that's really interesting. At, at, at no point I've ever thought about it like that. That's, that's really clear vision you've, you've laid out there. I want to come back in a little while to, to talk about some supply chain um, ideas and all those, also this kind of tension between distributed and centralized. But you started to touch on there the way that you can see existing technologies, old established technologies coming together with these new technologies. How well easy efficient or otherwise is it to bring those technologies together and what are some of the 
technological combinations that you're seeing? So the older technologies are very hard to combine with the new technologies. Not in that they're hard technologically to combine, but they're hard because they are the incumbents and all of this vast amount of scale of technology that has already been distributed makes it very hard to integrate with in today's world, which is everyone in order to be valuable in a systems approach has to have an API, right? The ability for us to communicate, but for two different computational systems to communicate, we do through APIs. And that's now base, that's standard for anyone who wants to be in the industry. But going backwards, all these millions of square feet, hectares and hectares of, of glass houses that don't have that, that's very difficult. But going forward, all of these companies are connecting together where you're seeing things like control systems. Here's a great example. Temperature, humidity, and water are, are granularly controlled and have been for over two decades, right? And so that allows you to see how they're, they've been optimized and now you wanna combine them together. And when you combine them together, you realize that the older ones don't, don't integrate well, right. but the new ones and the same companies now have APIs, yeah? And so that leads us to the ability of integrating the new technologies with the old technologies. And in our case, with computer vision, when you can control the environment and you can control the feeding, the only thing you're missing at that point to close the loop of farming is the ability to measure the thing you're manufacturing. And so it's very important for us to integrate with all the input controls because we become the virtual sensor that is the output control that tells you whether or not the plant is actually happy, sad, getting the food it needs. Yep. And so thus you have to integrate it is a, it is a must in order for our world to move forward and in the future to have a fully integrated system to close the loop. So that way we know when the plant needs more water, exactly how to connect it to the system that can give it more water. Or we know when the plant starts to have stunted growth or has uh, yellowing on the leaf, which is chlorosis. So if it has chlorosis, the system sees that and then works with both the grower and all of the connected systems through the APIs to remedy it. And that allows you to do a closed loop cycle in which it you allows you to do much more with less and allows you to see all of your plants at once without having to run around like a chicken with your head cut off. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm trying to envision now how a chicken with his head cut off would actually see whether the plant was good or not. However, we'll park that for now. I mean, one of one of the things that, that's that's kind of dropped in my mind with with um, with your explanation there was what the what a future kind of seed to table supply chain might look like. What are the plausible options in the future? So, will we see supermarkets with their own urban farms creating their own produce for sale? to their customers. So does that potentially change that element of the supply chain in the future? So we see some people, we see the urban farming movement where you're growing inside of the supermarket chain as marketing, not a sustainable solution. Okay. And the reason why it's so important for marketing is because consumer demand is what drives everything, right? We're a demand driven economy in, in a capitalistic society. And so because of that, the, the amount of people that buy that tomato or something, let's say something you can't, you, you, it doesn't make sense to grow any vine crops because they're so long in the supermarket, but it's a even leafy greens. The amount of people that buy that lettuce head every day, that when we walk into the supermarket, we think, oh, there's only five here. I'm taking one of the five today. That gets refreshed every hour, right? And so when you're... When, when you're walking in and you think it's your little safe space in which that everything's been curated for you, we forget that, that, that they go through a thousand lettuce heads a day, right? And so the amount of production that takes and the amount of scale that takes to be able to produce the amount of food that we consume turns these in-store growing modules into marketing machines to help consumers get feel closer and understand how things are grown but in reality, you can grow it 10 times cheaper, 20 minutes down the road, a little bit further away in a warehouse or a little bit further away rurally. And so connecting the consumer to how it's grown and that process is important. And that's why I love the in-store mechanisms, but growing them in the store doesn't give you enough turns and doesn't give you enough revenue per square foot for shelf space. 
that it makes tons of sense to grow everything in there. So we see the, oh, we're flying in leafy greens from California, moving to a rural greenhouse before it ever gets into a grocery store or That's supermarket. Interesting. I mean, one, one of the trends that we've seen in the UK as a result of the pandemic is changing customer behavior as far as groceries are concerned. So there are far fewer people actually making a trip to a supermarket. They're actually ordering online and either getting delivery of that or using click and collect services. Does that potentially change that dynamic about how supermarkets might choose to grow their own food if they're running from um, what I think of as, as dark stores, maybe, you know, one dark store in a large urban center that then distributes out to individual customers. Does that become more viable? Yeah, stores become distribution centers as yeah. we become more comfortable. It, it, it's it's the things that, that we used to consider were a pain and things that we used to consider were, oh, I have to go to the grocery store and get food really fast are going to become things that very few people can afford in the long run, yeah. right? It'll be more for posterity's sake. It'll be more for to reminisce and how it used to be, right? But where it's going is it's, it's just a, it's a giant, as you said, a dark store. It's a, it's, a, it's a distribution center. And at that point, not only let's go one step further with it, in the, in the, in the very future, consumers are, are going to be pre-ordering, oh, I want these things every week. And that will change the supply chain of when and what gets planted. And so depending on, and right now, in, in because we're taking a 50 to 70 day cycle of outdoor, for example, lettuce down to a 21, 24 day cycle, that allows you to now do just in time manufacturing of food for people based on the demand that they say they're going to have in the same month. And so the, 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 the next iteration is connecting people to, I want this every, give me a, a you know, I, I believe Amazon does this where you can order it monthly, right? Or, I think this is the subscription, right? Yeah. You can now subscribe to your food and based on how you change your subscription every month, they're going to plant something different in the greenhouse that is directly for you. And then you're going to be able to see a visual record of the exact plant that you're eating growing from start to finish. And people say, wow, that's really far away. And I say, it's not, we're already doing it. So with, with machine vision, part of augmenting the process of closing the loop and using it to find pests and diseases, using it for yield forecasting, that's great. But that also allows you to give something to the consumer, which is they can see the exact head of lettuce they're growing, that they're holding the whole process from seed all the way to in their hands, that entire process visually and with the data record that changes the whole food safety conversation. There's all these ramifications that come out of it, but but that's the future. That's where we're going with this. Is this is this is just in time manufacturing for consumer demand? That's fun. I love I love the kind of the, um, the the way you've positioned that as sort of an industrialization of food production, which leads me to you know, the last question I've got at the moment, which is, what role do you think industrialization of indoor agriculture through greenhouses, vertical farming? Um, broader urban agriculture, LED farming, what role do you think they play in the evolution of smart city development? Could these things, do you think, should they become more integrated? They absolutely are becoming more integrated. They should be integrated. I believe it's, simply, it's, sim it's more simple to say everything that consumers demand on a daily basis will be integrated into the industrial processes required to deliver uh, satisfaction to the population. And so I, 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 would, I would agree with the statement and where you're going with this, that it, it is all going to be, it will all be integrated into a single giant process. I mean, one, one of the things I see for, for urban centers is um, an increasing availability of real estate. I mean, if we look at some of the existing trends for, for work, um, and for uh, for retailing, for example, that we've seen over the course of the pandemic with more online commerce, uh, more hybrid working models between home and office. You can imagine, I can imagine certainly a time where at some point in the relatively near future, 
there's vacant real estate in the middle of London, in the middle of New York, in the, the middle of Seattle, you know, wherever it might be, because people are not going to shop and they're not going to work. Does that create capacity for more urban centered farming, for more urban agriculture? And that and and this is where looking into the future oftentimes creates more questions than answers. Yeah. But then you have to ask the question of well, what's the highest and best use of this underutilized space? Yeah. And farming may be the highest and best use, but maybe not. Maybe people want to live there for cheap. Maybe it becomes government subsidized housing. Maybe it becomes a vertical farm. But the but the next best alternative to the current use of office space or for retail is not up to me. One of the possibilities yeah. is farming, but that will have a certain revenue per square foot and profit per, uh, revenue per square meter, profit per square meter answer, but that may not be good enough compared to something that's right above it. For all we know, maybe housing, right? It may be dorms, it may be a hotel. There's there, so the, the concept of, of space utilization is crucial and that you can't, we can't look at that in a vacuum. So I don't know the answer. I, I think that's absolutely right. That last comment you made there about not looking at this in a vacuum and 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 does um, the freeing up of real estate in in urban centres provide uh, a potential solution for homelessness, for example, for increasing social housing and so on. I think you're absolutely right, um, Adam. That's been absolutely wonderful. I know that wasn't a, wasn't a lot of time, but uh, uh, thank you so much for your time. There's some really wonderful insights there. I think that uh, have lots of connections with other things that I'm talking to people about. So thank you for that. Tell us how can people get in touch with you? Can see the work that you're doing? Can find out more about the processes, the technologies that you're using? Yeah. So if you, if you're interested in what we're doing, you can go to iunu.com. Uh, or you can reach out to me via email. It's just A-D-A-M, Adam, at I-U-N, N is in Nancy, U.com, because it sounds like M sometimes, but uh, I-U-N-U dot com. And happy to, to converse further, to uh, talk deeper about the future. This is some of my favorite stuff to talk about. So thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. And it was a lot of fun. Thanks ever so much, Adam. And thank you, everyone, for listening. I'll see you again soon on another episode of the Informing Choices Minipod.